This is Logan Seculo. Rashida Tlaib refuses to condemn chants of death to America in her own district. Keeping you informed and engaged, now more than ever, this is Seculo. We want to hear from you. Share and post your comments or call 1-800-684-3110. And now your host, Logan Seculo. Welcome to Seculo. This is Logan Seculo. Join me, Will Haynes, in the studio, executive producer of this broadcast. we got a great show lined up for you today. Some really fun and interesting topics and, of course, some shocking ones as well. We'd love to hear from you. 1-800-684-3110 to have your voice heard. We're going to kick this off pretty strong, as you saw maybe in the comment or maybe in the description title. What is it is that Rashida Tlaib has refused to condemn chance of death to America. But before we get there, I think you have to have a bit of a setup of how we even got to her refusing to condemn it, Will. That's right. So this is a a video of an activist in Dearborn, Michigan, which is in Rashida Tlaib's district. Uh, His name is Tarek Bazi. And he was at a rally that uh, some may say pro-Palestinian, we would say pro-Hamas, and in some instances, as you're about to see, pro-Ayatollah of Iran. Let's go ahead and roll this clip. It's the United States government that provides the funds for all of the atrocities that we just heard about. And this is why Imam Khomeini, who declared the International Day of Quds, this is why he would say to pour all of your cha- all of your chants and all of your shouts upon the head of America. It's not genocide Joe that has to go. It's the entire system that has to go. Any system that would allow such atrocities and such devilry to to happen and would support it, such a system does not deserve to exist on God's earth. And so when these fools ask us if Israel has the right to exist, the chant death to Israel has become the most logical chant shouted across the world today. And that's right. Is that somewhere in the Middle East? No, of course. That is somewhere in the Middle West. That is in (laughs) Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, You are seeing that chant break out death to America as well as obviously, what do you say, the most logical yeah, the most logical chant is death to Israel, to Israel. in this time. However, but also, they threw in death to America. He quoted favorably the Ayatollah Khomeini from Iran. There's a lot to unpack there, but as you'll see on the other side of this break, we're going to see how Rashida Tlaib, who represents that district, yeah. responded when she was asked about it in the halls of Congress. Sure, and we're going to be joined by Harry Hutchinson, who's going to come in here. Michigan native, so he's going to uh, That's right. discuss that whole area of the world. Uh, not quite Detroit Rock City anymore, Will. Co- phone lines are open, 1-800-684-3110, 1-800-684-3110. When you hear this is happening on the streets of America, in places like Michigan, how does that make you feel? Again, it sounds like something coming out of a Middle East protest in wartime, but no, it's coming out of right here, and is oddly... You know, I believe we should have the freedom of speech to say what we want. But where is the line? And is the line at death to America? They probably say, well, that's broad enough. That's not a specific threat. That's just everybody. So that's okay. I want to hear from you. 1-800-684-3110. Also, Mike Pompeo is going to join us later in the broadcast. Uh, and we're going to give you a lot of updates, including some ACLJ wins, some quick wins, a real fun one, I have to say. Maybe one of my favorite ones, helping out some Jewish students uh, in the state of Georgia, my old home state. Uh, and we were able to get a resolution very quickly for them. You'll get to see firsthand what the work of the ACLJ does. And all of that has happened in the last hour. This is pretty wild. That's how quick we can work here. Again, phone lines are open at 1-800-684-3110. But our work for life and liberty continues each and every day. And, of course, during this Life and Liberty Drive for the month of April, your gifts are doubled. That's right. It helps us here at home and around the globe also helps our media work as well and we have top legal analysis top legal team and obviously if we want the best of the best we got to be able to afford the best of the best we can't do that without your financial support you're going to hear from one of those coming up uh, in just a segment you have harry hutchinson joining us to really break down all that's happening and you're going to hear the words of rashida talib when confronted by the big bad evil fox news the jackie heinrichs <laughs> it's ridiculous we'll be right back on seculo go to aclj.org to support the work right now. 
anti-Israel protesters in Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib's Michigan district are not holding back their criticism against the United States support for Israel's war on Hamas. Listen. The chant, death to Israel, has become the most logical chant shouted across the world today. It's not genocide Joe that has to go. It's the entire system that has to go. That was Michigan, and they were celebrating El Quds Day, a celebration of the Iranian security forces. That particular event was on Friday in Dearborn, Michigan, and uh, in February, a Wall Street Journal op-ed writer uh, referred to Dearborn as America's jihad capital. Death to America, death to Israel is uh, the main important slogan uh, by the Iranian regime, trying to expand their ideology across the globe. Really concerning right now that this is the rhetoric we are hearing both anti-Israel, but also holding America, these communities, are holding America to account, uh, to account for what's happening in Gaza. And so the concern right now is that this could escalate and the eyes really have to be kept on it. Congresswoman to leave Fox News. I don't talk to Fox News. At a rally in your district, people were chanting death to America. Do you condemn? I do not talk to Fox News. But do you condemn chants of death to America? I don't talk to people that use racist tropes. Why can't you just say whether or not you condemn people chanting death to America? Why are you afraid to talk to Fox? Fox News is not, not listen, I mean, using racist tropes towards my community is what Fox News is about. I don't talk to Fox News. Is death to America racist? Is chanting death to America racist? I'm talking about your guys' racist tropes. You know, you guys are, you guys know exactly what you do. I know you're Islamophobic, but you guys got to go deal with it on your own self. You're not going to use me. Welcome back. If you're watching, you got to see the clip, but we're going to play it here in just a second again to clarify. Hillary Vaughn from Fox News approached Rashida Tlaib uh, in the hallway, as they do, as reporters do, to address what happened in Dearborn, Michigan. And look, I have to say, there's a lot of you right now in the chat and a lot of you calling in from Michigan. So I appreciate that. So if you're from Michigan, say hello. Also, I really like on uh, YouTube and on Rumble and on Facebook. Tell me where you're watching from. I love to see worldwide the impact this broadcast has. So put in there, put your city, state. If you're, you're out of the country, I'd love to hear from that. I know we've got a lot of Canadian uh, viewers as well. So hello to all of our Canadian viewers. I hope we are keeping you entertained as we cover what goes on in American politics. And this is what happens. There was chance uh, at a pro-Palestinian slash, we'd say, a pro -pa uh, pro-Hamas rally that happened in Dearborn, Michigan, where you heard chance of the most logical chance, they said, of course, were death to Israel. But they decided, let's throw in a little death to America as well. And then, later on, uh, Hillary Vaughn from Fox News confronted Rashida Tlaib. Uh, again, was that this morning or yesterday? It was yesterday. Yesterday. Yeah. yesterday. So take a listen if you're listening. If not, watch it. We're going to see it right here. Congresswoman Tlaib. Fox News. I don't talk to Fox News. At a rally in your district, people were chanting death to America. Do you condemn talk to Fox News. But do you condemn chants of death to America? I don't talk to people that use racist tropes. Why can't you just say whether or not you condemn people chanting death to America? Why are you afraid to talk to Fox? Fox News is not, not listen, using racist tropes towards my community is what Fox News is about, and I don't talk to Fox News. Is death to America racist? Is chanting death to America racist? I'm talking about your guys' racist tropes. You know, you guys are, you guys know exactly what you do. And I know you're Islamophobic, but you guys got to go deal with it on your own self. You're not going to use me. Yep. All right. And there you have it. So being confronted with what do you have to say about people in your district, in your area, screaming death to America. How do you feel about that? And she says, I'm not talking to Fox News. You guys are the racist. Of course. We're joined by uh, Harry Hutchinson in the studio, who, hey. You grew up in the area, knows it well. Absolutely. <laughs> so um, this is unsurprising. Uh, essentially, Dearborn, Michigan has a very rocky history. Um, it was basically a city characterized by racism. Uh, it was a city founded by Henry Ford. And ironically enough, the demonstration took place in front of the Henry Ford Centennial Library, and as I think everyone knows, Henry Ford had a distinguished history of anti-Semitism uh, before World War II, 
And in many respects, the demonstration that happened in Dearborn last week is a continuation of a historical pattern uh, that has essentially captured, unfortunately, a part of my home state. Um, so in any case, uh, you can see or hear chants of death to America and death to Israel. Um, and essentially, the protesters are embracing what might be called the Cloward Peven revolutionary strategy. Who is Cloward? Who is Pe- Piven? Those are two Columbia University sociologists who've adopted a revolutionary approach to destroying the market system and essentially destroying America. And how do you do that? You focus on identity and you focus on alleged oppression. And so in this particular case, the protesters are casting the entirety of America and particularly Israel as oppressors, and they see themselves as oppressed people. And unfortunately, um, many um, academics support this yeah, approach. Yeah, it's becoming the uh, prevailing theory, if you will. Professor Hutchison, you, you see, one, the protest, but on the other hand, the inability and refusal, outright refusal, of Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib to condemn it. I, I understand she used it as a political moment to go after Fox News, but wouldn't you think uh, with the state of affairs in the United States and what was being said at the rally, she could have both said, I don't normally talk to you, but of course I condemn death to America. What do you think her play was there by refusing to answer the question? Well, I think she is playing brilliantly, if you will, the oppression card. And it will play well, unfortunately, in her district, um, and it will help ensure her reelection. So she's not playing to the American people. She's uh, focused on her particular district. Now, I think in the scheme of things, this perhaps hurts the Democratic Party, but I'm not sure she's particularly concerned about that. I think she is a particularly self-interested individual. And we know that both in Michigan and Minnesota, both have large Islamic communities. uh, that Growing communities. It's become very, in even recent years, you've seen a a large uh, change in demographics there. But we know the concern that the Democrat Party currently has is uh, backlash for, as the uh, speaker at the rally said, they're calling... Joe Biden genocide Joe, they need those states in a general election to stave off a Trump victory. What position is the the Democrat Party at large in right now when you're seeing this come out of Dearborn, Michigan? And does that turn off voters that may want to vote for Democrats? Or does it also uh, push the Biden administration's hand to try to placate them a little more? Well, I think it will push the Biden administration to try to placate uh, individuals in Minnesota and Michigan, particularly uh, Muslims. However, I think that will then backfire in a number of other swing states. And so I think uh, Biden is in a very, very tough situation. But I think Biden is in this tough situation in part because of his failure to adopt sound principles. And so I think if he had stated initially that he was going to defend the right of a country that was attacked on October the 7th to respond, and if he had maintained that consistent approach, that would have played out better for him. But I think Biden... Uh, perhaps pushed by uh, many of the elites that he has actually appointed in the State Department and elsewhere, uh, he has basically weakened. And I think if you want to adopt dual opposing positions, which I think is the Biden administration approach, you will shoot yourself in the foot and deservedly so. Well, it's over and over it seems like that happens. And it seems like that there's what President Biden has to say and then what the administration has to say. And it, it always seems... Like they're somewhat at odds with each other, maybe because they can't somehow get on the same page or someone's not informed of, the, of of what the true policy is 
uh, based on whatever he decides he thinks is right. And that even happened. Uh, this is just was this from yesterday. Also, yes, yeah, from, this the from yesterday, secretary. from press secretary, you know, from KJP was confronted with the question about this protest that we saw in the streets again that ended or happened to feature chance death to America and death to Israel. Let's hear what she had to say. Should we expect a statement from the president on that, though? I mean, it was a pretty significant display. I mean, you're hearing from me. I think that's uh, important. The other part, too, that I do want to be very clear about, you know, peaceful protest is something that the president has also been very, uh, very clear that is important for to give folks space to peacefully protest. But any type of uh, violent rhetoric we are going to denounce. I'm going to ask you this, uh, Professor Hutchinson, which is obviously we're all for the freedom of speech, protect the freedom of speech, protect peaceful protest. I think that's very important. I think it's one of the most important things we have in this country. But where's the line? I guess, where's the line from calling for violence? Or you know, we've, we've seen this now on uh, college campuses where you've had the college, uh, perf- the heads of the college say, well, it wasn't specific. I think it was the head of Harvard or one right, of those. Right. Said it, it wasn't specifically saying death to those Jewish students. It was death to all of them, you know, to everyone. And therefore, that's not specific threats. But at some point... You know, we were all grow- we all grew up with the you have the freedom of speech, but you can't yell you know fire in a crowded theater. Where does that line kick in? <laughs> well, I think for the administration, there is n- no real line except a weasel line. Uh, I would argue that death to America is inherently violent right. as a chant, I think most people and agree. I think that's self evidently clear to most Americans. But uh, to give the press secretary of uh, Joe Biden credit, uh, that is something that she probably doesn't understand or doesn't want to understand. So I think her unwillingness to call out those particular demonstrators, uh, I think, will hurt the president in November. Uh, and I think many American people would share that. Yeah, just uh, trying to sentiment. placate those couple states. And, and Karine Jean Pierre did give a one word answer that, yes, they do condemn it. But that was her longer explanation as well, okay. which does give a little bit of wiggle room about what becomes violent rhetoric. However, it does appear, at least for now, they condemn death to America. We'll see how long that lasts. Phone lines are jammed right now, but we will get to you actually coming up a little bit later in the show. So if you are on hold, just stay on hold. I will get to you. And maybe a little later. Just stay on hold. We'll get to you. Coming up next, we're going to be joined by CC Heil with a big uh, update and a win, actually, that came out. A very quick win for the ACLJ in support of Jewish students in this time as Passover is approaching. It's a pretty interesting one. It shows you the scope of the work of the ACLJ, whether that is supporting uh, the biggest clients at the biggest possible level you can worldwide or individual students at a university in the state of Georgia. We'll be right back with that coming up. The law, the what they were calling the, the Civil War era, 1800s law, uh, on abortion and on life and the protection of life has gone into play. And there's really important things you need to know about how we were involved in that. So we did file an amicus brief and we argued that Arizona has a long history of protecting innocent pre-born life. And over the, 100 years. <laughs> that's exactly yeah. right. And the court really agreed. And I, I just want to kind of read what the holding was. The legislature has demonstrated its consistent design to restrict elective abortion to the degree permitted by the Supremacy Clause and an unwavering intent since 1864 to prescribe elective abortions absent a federal constitutional right, precisely what it intended and accomplished. To date, our legislature has never affirmatively created a right to or independently authorized elective abortion. And that's what we argued and that's what they found. And so now they are pointing that unless something else is done, this law is in effect. Even before Roe was overturned through the Dobbs decision, You did see many states that went beyond Roe, whether it was New York or we knew uh, the Governor Northam that was pushing for a late term uh, bill in Virginia uh, when that famous comment about uh, let the uh, baby be born and then we'll decide what to do with it, that states have the opportunity, if they had a law on the books, to go back and change that if that were the will of the state. That's right. And in states like Arizona, where that didn't happen, the court rightly holds, it sounds like, that yes. they're saying they had an opportunity to change this if that was their will, right. even under Roe, but they didn't. They just relied on Roe, so therefore we can infer right. that the will of the legislature remains. We've known when Dobbs came down that there would be state battles, and we've seen this 
here in Arizona, but we're we're happy with the results. It follows along what we argued in our amicus brief, and we think the court got it right. Welcome back to Secular. We are joined in studio by Secret Attorney CC Hyle. We have a pretty interesting update and a, a big ACLJ. You know what? They're all big wins. Even if they're small, even if they sound like they are little accommodations or whatever it is, uh, if it helps and protects the American people from discrimination uh, based on their religious beliefs, it's a big win. And that's precisely what happened in a very quick amount of time. And I won't, I won't spoil it. I'll let us start again. I like telling the story from the beginning. So the beginning was just a week ago. That's right. So just the last week, we were contacted that Georgia State, um, their final exams were going to actually coincide exactly with Passover. And so, um, you know, when you have Jewish students that are observing Passover, that is going to interfere with really the ability to prepare, study, and take final exams. And so, you know, religious accommodation needed to be had. And it was brought to our attention that this was going on, that the final exams were at the same time as Passover. And so we sent a letter to Georgia State. And, you know, we pointed out the fact that this is literally the first Passover since October 7th. Yeah, since October her- 7th, and this is Georgia State University, the heart of Atlanta, a uh, large Jewish community uh, right. in Atlanta. I grew up in Atlanta. So, I mean, I'm very familiar with the college. This should be something that not only is accommodated, but is prepared for in some ways yeah that they should be prepared for it and and that's really what we pointed out again that this is the first passover since the horrific attacks of october 7th and that jewish students across the country have been facing backlash and and discrimination and protests against them and so just reminding georgia state that you know be be aware please make sure that they know about the accommodations um, and we set out all the facts, and we literally, our, our ask was, in light of the above, we respectfully ask that you proactively address this conflict for the students and faculty by publicly acknowledging that a conflict exists and directing them to the accommodation procedure to rectify this issue. And we just received a letter today. Yeah, within the last, we, we've that's received right. it, it was, in the last hour. That's exactly right. We sent this letter on Friday, and we just, literally just received a letter from uh, Georgia State saying, of course, they would do that, and they have sent out an email blast, actually. They've already done that and, and told all the students of this conflict yeah. and how to request an accommodation. What I like about this specifically also in that letter of response, which I'm sure we can we can get the exact verbiage if someone could pull that for me, is it specifically mentions is because you brought this up to us, we have changed our policy. Right, and I have the letter in front of me. That and that from. is a, a big deal. That is why we're here. That's why we have incredible attorneys on the ground, ready to go in all states, ready to help when there's a situation like this that comes up. Because sometimes it's as simple as this is we, we demand it. But it, again, it wasn't like a, oops, we made a mistake. It was, hey, you brought this to our attention. And now we've notified our entire student body, which is pretty gigantic uh, at Georgia State. That's right. So it says we appreciate you bringing this matter to our attention We acknowledge the importance of recognizing religious beliefs and providing accommodation to allow students, faculty, and staff to practice their respective beliefs. In response to your letter, we sent a campus broadcast today to students, faculty, and staff reminding them of the university's policies and the process for seeking an accommodation, should one be needed. Now, there's about 30,000 students. Then you add the staff and the faculty. This wasn't this wasn't a uh, email to 30 people. This was a large campus wide broadcasted message that people now can take comfort that if they need that religious accommodation to to take part in the Passover season, they can do that and they know how to do it. And, and if you have a similar situation happening to you, it, it doesn't have to be for Passover. It could be Passover. It could have been Easter. It could be any religious holidays or whatever you're celebrating. There's a lot of people right now we're just wrapped up Ramadan. Like we are here. The ACLJ is here to protect your religious freedoms regardless. Go to aclj.org slash help. Put in your request. We want to help. That is why we are here. That is why we have people who support us. You, the ACLJ donors and ACLJ champions, those are people that give each and every month to the ACLJ. We have that so we can afford, afford an incredible team, whether that is our video team, our media team, our social media team, whatever it is, and, of course, our legal team. That's why we see it here right now. We can't do that 
at no cost, which is what we do. We provide it at no cost, but obviously we want to pay our staff because we want to have the best of the best. We can't do that without your support at ACLJ.org. Of course, this does come uh, in a moment where there was ceasefire talks happening That's right. with Hamas and Israel and sort of the sad truth that I think a lot of us expected and maybe didn't get quite enough attention yesterday, which was uh, you know, part of the deal was going to be that Hamas would release 100 uh, hostages and pretty much Hamas responded with, we don't have 100 left. Yeah, we don't have 40 left. We don't have 40 left. left. Right, that are alive, that will comply. And that's, like you said, I think a lot of us were worried about that, especially because Israel has repeatedly, um, you know, agreed to negotiate and made agreements on the negotiations. And every single time Hamas has said no. And so it was very telling of, well, perhaps they're saying no because they don't have the hostages to release. And now they've actually admitted that, that at least they don't have 40 hostages um, that they can release for this agreement. Especially under the criteria and the framework that was being negotiated with the mediators, Qatar and Egypt. Uh, it, it is. I think people need to understand that how this works. Because right. you think like, well, they're going to place a call. How does this work? Right. So the United States works with uh, Egypt and Qatar, which both have um Delegations and sort of working diplomatic yeah. relationships to some degree with representatives from Hamas so that they can take care of issues like this. It's not like we're sending our secretary of state to go directly meet with the heads of Hamas in uh, the right. Four Seasons in Qatar, where they like to hang out and uh, live a lifestyle unlike the people that are oppressed in Gaza by Hamas. But uh, it is sad. It is something we sort of expected but I also think that this is telling because this does take some of the guardrails off of Israel, which was trying desperately to get hostages home. I think it also raises a lot of questions for this administration because there, I believe the number was 10 unaccounted for hostages from the previous deals that are American citizens. Yeah. And if Hamas is saying they don't have 40 that meet the criteria, maybe those U.S. citizens were outside of the criteria of this negotiated deal. But I think that if the Biden administration keeps placating Hamas as they have been at the U.N., from the podium of the White House briefing room, from the president of the United States himself, I think that they have a lot of explaining to do when it comes to why they weren't fighting every single day to get 10 U.S. citizens freed, which may, if they are included in this 40 they don't have, could possibly no longer be living. Yeah, we are ahead. There's a reason that the ACLJ is here. We obviously have an office also in Jerusalem, the ACLJ. Uh, Jerusalem, which you've heard from Jeff Balaban over the last few weeks on this, last few months on this broadcast, giving you updates live on the ground in Israel. And we are in the middle. You know, it's April 11th right now. We are in the middle of our Life and Liberty Drive for the month of April. We have focused a lot of it on life uh, or on liberty. And this is where it's very important. When you hear about just what you think is a small moment, just kids who wanted to celebrate Passover with their families and their professors saying, no, we're not accommodating you for your religious holidays. And we're able to step in and within days, get a response. And you may say, hey, Logan, less, uh, that's less than a week. That's pretty great. But hey, shouldn't they be responding even faster? And my answer to that is, yes, they should. But remember what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with the state university system. It's like dealing with the DMV. So the fact they got back to us in six days is a miracle. Impressive, it really actually, is, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, very proud of the work here that we're doing at the ACLJ and continue to fight for life and liberty around the world. You can be a part of it right now. Join the great legal minds and the media team here at the ACLJ by going to ACLJ.org. Have your gifts doubled today throughout the month. We need your support to keep us in all these legal fights and provide this incredible media you can't get anywhere else. We'll be right back. Folks, last year we launched our first ACLJ Life and Liberty Drive, and even we couldn't anticipate how successful it would become. Thanks to you, our ACLJ members and champions. The rights to life and liberty are the cornerstones of our constitutional republic, but they are under attack. That is why we're proud to announce the return of the ACLJ Life and Liberty Drive. This month, we're redoubling our efforts to beat back the radical left's attacks on your constitutional freedoms and to defend the sanctity of human life, not just here at home, but around the world, the lives of the unborn, the persecuted around the globe, and our family, friends, and allies in Israel. This is your moment to get in the fight. Every tax-deductible gift you give will be doubled. 
through the ACLJ Life and Liberty Drive, giving you twice the impact to defend your freedoms and help us fight to literally save lives. This is your time. Go to ACLJ.org right now and join us in this fight. Keeping you informed and engaged, now more than ever, this is Seculo. And now your host, Logan Seculo. Welcome to Seculo, second half hour if you're joining us uh, live. Welcome if you're watching on YouTube, Rumble, or Facebook. I'm going to ask you to click that like button. If you see a little thumbs up or the like, do that for me. I really would appreciate it. So do that right now. I'm going to watch it go up. As we do, we're going to take some calls right off the bat. Let's go to Tina, who's calling a Pennsylvania line one. Tina, you're on the air. Hi, Logan. Hey. I have a comment, um, and I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm being nasty or anything, <laughs> but all of these people that are flying the Palestinian flag over the American flag saying death to America, let's round them up, send them back. When well, they come to this country... You know what's crazy, Tina, I'm going to say this, is that a lot of them are Americans. We're dealing with a situation where, sure, there's there's plenty of people who have come in through different parts of the country. And I mean to cut you off as well. I mean, I'm happy to go back to you. But remember what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with the university system. We're dealing with people on the streets, uh, protests that are happening. These aren't, um, these, a lot of these are Americans. You know? Well, and Rashida Tlaib, an American citizen, yeah. she's flying the Palestinian flag in front of her office door in the U.S. Capitol. Yeah. So there is, but I understand the sentiment of Tina yeah, that it, it well, if, you have, if you're you have a, a visceral representative, reaction when someone starts yeah. saying, Tina, like you said, when someone says, Death to America. Your first instinct is, why are they here in America? Um, we do have freedom of speech. I do believe in that. I do believe maybe there is a line, and that line is maybe when you're calling for destruction of the country of which you live in and everyone in it, which I guess you could come up with some other weird way. Because, look, they're not happy with President Biden. Remember, that's the first thing that guy says. He is, called him Genocide Joe. Genocide Joe. I mean, that's a, I mean, that feels like a Donald Trump type uh, it does. nickname. I mean, he may adopt it going forward. Yeah, but. I think so. Uh, give us a call. I'd love to hear from you. 1-800-684-3110. Thanks, Tina. Got a couple calls on the deck as well. We're going to get to you guys, if you're still listening, um, a little bit later in the broadcast. So next up, we have Mike Pompeo joining us. And then after that, so we'll have this segment, which is a couple more minutes, then a segment with Mike Pompeo. And then at the end of the broadcast, I'm going to take all the calls I can. So if you have a question or comment related to any of the topics we brought up today or any other topic for that matter that is within ACLJ scope, I want to hear from you. If you're watching online, even better, 1-800-684-3110. Ashley and Paula, stay on hold. We will get to you. Uh, well, this is, if you're just joining us, I know a lot of you are, a, a lot of this stemmed from a, protest that happened obviously we've seen pro-palestinian slash pro-hamas protests around the world um in, in, in every part of the western world and in the middle east uh, we've seen these protests break out but this one was specifically in dearborn michigan you know in again in the middle of the country where it seems like you know we, we had on harry hutchinson who's regardless of how you feel a lot of of america was made in that state right. whether that is music whether that is motors uh some of the most important things that have come out have come out of Michigan. Uh, and I love Michigan from that sense. I love some of the history that is there. Uh, but when you have now this and in Minnesota as well, another state that I just love but has been uh, sadly become these places where it feels like anti-Semitism is not only accepted, but it's advertised to where you have to bow down to it. Well, in the fact that people feel comfortable enough to do this at a rally, like this wasn't. Yeah, oh, you're like, you're hearing from, um, you know, this leaked video exactly. Of a, no, Islamic this was a Center. filmed public rally, and and this comes also at a time where the the FBI director will be at a subcommittee hearing on appropriations today, asking for more money for the FBI, because he's going to warn of an elevated public national safety issue, and he's going to push for more funding. But yet we know that they were targeting churches because they were concerned about extremist Catholics on the lead up to election. But yet in public, people are saying death to America. There's something not right with the FBI if this is the case and their focus is on radical traditional Catholics. Absolutely. We will be back in just about a minute. So make sure you stay tuned. Uh, phone lines are jammed. We actually one just opened up. one 800 
684-3110. That could be you on the air in just a few minutes. Coming up, Mike Pompeo is going to be joining us. He's got a brand new article on ACLJ.org. So not only do I encourage you to go support the work of the ACLJ by going and making a donation, go read the incredible content. Go watch the incredible content produced by our amazing team at absolutely no cost to you. Go to ACLJ.org, read that article, and we'll be right back with Secretary Pompeo. Well, that video is from Iran last week. Protesters in Tehran chanting death to America. And now we're seeing that chilling anti-American sentiment here. The chant death to Israel has become the most logical chant shouted across the world today. It's not genocide Joe that has to go. It's the entire system that has to go. None of this should shock anyone who's been paying attention because those protesters are saying what most activists on the left think. In Iran, my people get killed for the crime of saying death to uh, Islamic Republic. They face rape in prison for the crime of saying that we don't want Islamic Republic to create war in the region. But Islamic Republic, they want to fight against Israel and America. Uh, they're like octopus and they want to expand the Islamic ideology across the globe. That's what uh, concerns me. The concern, the worry is that there is a growing move in some of these communities towards jihadi-like movements. Look, Memory, a group that looks and analyzes the kind of rhetoric coming out of the, these communities, has said that there is a, a concern here. What I want to know is these are people who are just mired not only in feelings, but very, very angry, hostile feelings that I want to know what their vision for the country is. So let's say America's awful. Let's say this place sucks and they just want to level it. What are you going to replace it with? How will my life and the lives of my children and my family be better under your vision? I don't trust that because they don't have one and they don't want peace. They don't want happiness. They just want eradication. Welcome back to Secula. We are joined by Secretary Mike Pompeo. A, a really uh, interesting time. We've been discussing for the last 40 minutes or so, Secretary Pompeo, the protests on the streets of Dearborn, Michigan, that obviously were leading to death to America chants. And we've learned now um, through a lot of the channels that were happening or negotiating potential ceasefires in Israel with Israel and Hamas uh, that they don't even have, according to them, that 40 Israeli hostage threshold right now needed for the ceasefire. Knowing that sort of sad truth that I think a lot of us probably expected at this point, six months out from October 6th, that how does that change negotiations going forward, knowing that maybe some of those those bargaining tools are, are sadly uh, not there anymore? Well, Logan, I, I guess a couple of thoughts as you connect these two things, right? Uh, radical left protesters in the, inside the United States shouting death to America. This is the pro Hamas wing uh, that President Biden has been, frankly, uh, sensitive to in a way that has undermined the second issue, which is the effort to get these hostages all home. I, I think I've said since, gosh, maybe not October 8th, but shortly thereafter, the only way to bring these hostages home is to apply pressure to the leadership in Iran. And the Biden administration hasn't done that. And so the fact that these folks have perished in captivity, some of them almost certainly, although I don't know the facts, some of them almost certainly Americans, uh, is a failure of American leadership to allow Israel to do the necessary to both push back against Hamas and apply pressure to the leadership so the hostages could get home, but also prevent something like October 7th from happening again, whether that be in Israel or someplace else. And these folks who are here in America chanting death to our nation I think, reflect an idea of Israel and Hamas as morally equivalent. The Secretary Blinken came dangerously close to uttering that is a really dangerous thing for the United States of America. Secretary Pompeo, I had a, a question also about the the chance of death to America in Dearborn, Michigan, because we're just a few weeks past President Biden giving his State of the Union address which do you think we learned more about the state of our union from the president's address or 
the images from that rally at Dearborn, Michigan? You know, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I, I, we didn't learn much about the state of America and President Biden's State of the Union. That's for sure. It was antagonistic. It was political. It wasn't about the State of the Union. It was a defense of the indefensible in terms of the failures of the last three and a half years of the Biden administration. Uh, and I'm I'm also hopeful that the chance that we hear in Dearborn, Michigan, will be met with enormous resistance from a broad spectrum of Americans. I don't think we should allow anyone, any Democrat, to go a single minute without responding to those threats. We should ask everybody whose party these folks are from, do you support that? Are these the kind of people that you think uh, represent and reflect our nation and its Judeo-Christian founding? Uh, if you do, fine, let us know. But folks who are seeking the support of the American people ought not to be condoning or encouraging or even tacitly acknowledging the acceptability of what these people are saying in Dearborn, Michigan today. We've, we've known this for a long time. This anti-Semitic, anti-American movement inside of our country is bigger than we wish it were, and it's each of our responsibility to push back against it. You have a brand new article up on our website. Now, I do want to encourage everyone, if you're watching right now, you need to go to aclj.org and just look at the incredible content that gets posted there each and every day, whether that's from people like Secretary Pompeo or any of the, any of the voices you've heard today have articles going up, plus tons of others have articles, blogs, video pieces. So go to aclj.org. It's at no cost. There's no paywall. Uh, do that. Obviously, support the work if you can. But even without that, go get yourself educated. And, and your new article is called Why America is Less Safe Now. And uh, it really kind of breaks down what is happening uh, in our world. Yeah, it's why does the world feel more dangerous in the last three years? Because it is. Here's why. And obviously breaks down why it feels that way. I think a lot of us could probably jump to our own conclusion. But one of the reasons you gave is that under President Trump and under your command also, we clearly were identifying our enemies. We're obviously not seeing that uh, strongly, at least coming out of the Biden administration. Maybe you're seeing a mixed messaging at best. Uh, but how do you feel about that? Why is that something you feel is happening uh, currently? So I think the reason many Americans rightly perceive more risk in America is because President Biden has not demonstrated the basic understanding of how it is you keep Americans safe. The, the first piece of that is always a strong America at home, a strong economy, uh, a southern border that's secure. And we've we've not had either of those. That's demonstrably true. That's not political. Those are just factual observations. Uh, but second, the things that we've done abroad have caused our allies to wonder, will the United States be with them? So think about uh, the 13 Americans that were killed in the debacle that was our departure from Afghanistan. Or think about the fact that Vladimir Putin felt it sufficiently uh, safe that he could go invade Europe and Hamas and Iran felt, well, this is the day. Let's go. Let's go at this. Uh, President Biden's not going to do a darn thing. Indeed, he may well constrain the Israelis from defending their own country. Those those are those are things that are tangible. Someone who was tasked with being a practitioner it wasn't enough for me to be in a classroom talking about deterrence and theory. We had to actually execute it. I saw the things that caused our adversaries to say, not 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 today. I'm not going to I'm not going to take Taiwan. I'm not going to invade Israel. I'm not going to invade Europe. It was a leader, President Trump, who was prepared to defend our nation and hold responsible people who put American lives at risk. And we simply don't have that in the White House today. And in that idea of peace through strength, which uh, has been kind of a, a standpoint from conservatives and Republicans for generations now, um, we're seeing that abandoned by the current administration, but it works so well against adversaries like Russia and China. Uh, what do you see of those current threats today, Russia and China, as we are in an election year and as we uh, look at uh, inst instability around the world? So I'm, I'm certainly worried that we could have even further erosion of our deterrence in the, what do we have? Uh, six months, seven months before the election, and uh, now some eight months before hopefully there's a, a change in leadership in the White House. Um, I'm very worried about some something breaking even further. But I must say that the, the pillar of deterrence that is most missing is strength here at home. Uh, demonstrated capacity for America to innovate, create, grow its economy, build in a way that just simply can't happen when you have a government that is too big, too bloated, too regulatory, too many taxes, all, all of those things that we have known as conservatives for a long time uh, destroy our nation. They put us at, at risk abroad as well. And, you know, finally, 
you need a leader who's prepared to talk to the American people. And one of the things that has been missing from President Biden is his capacity to stand in front of the American people, take questions and explain and answer why it is he's made the decisions he has. If you can't defend your policies, if the president of the United States himself, it can't be his secretary of state, it can't be his public relations team, it can't be his national security advisor. If the president himself cannot articulate his vision for American greatness, then uh, the people around the world, our bad guys will feel free to move about the cabin and our friends will begin to hedge their bets and walk away from us in ways that really put the American people at risk. Thank you, Secretary Pompeo. Again, Senior Counsel for Global Affairs at the ACLJ. Check out his new article right now on ACLJ. Dot org And thank you for your continued uh, work with us. And it really means a lot. It hopefully means a lot to you. Also, the, the listener and the viewer of this broadcast each and every day to hear from such incredible minds like Secretary Pompeo. Uh, it is it's mind blowing to be a part of this broadcast sometimes and hear such expert levels, whether that was from now three senior attorneys. Uh, and of course, a former Secretary of State uh, who was able to join us on this broadcast to break down all this happening and will None of that happens without the support uh, of the ACLJ donor and the ACLJ champions, those that give each and every month. And we are here wrapping up our halfway through our Life and Liberty Drive. And um, again, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. If you are on hold right now, I know six of you are. Phone lines are completely jammed. I want you to stay on hold because in the next segment of the broadcast, we're going to take all of them. So Rick, Paula, Terry, Ashley, Mark, and Susan – representing, it looks like, a whole swath of the country. Stay on hold. We'll get to you, and we'll try to get to some more of you coming up as well. But like I said, we are here. The work for the ACLJ continues each and every day, fighting for life and liberty, and your gifts are doubled during this Life and Liberty Drive. And right now, and again, we're, we're April 10th, April 11th, where are we at, Tim? It's the 11th. The 11th, April yeah. 11th. April 11th, almost halfway through this month of April, and again, Kind of in the life of liberty, we've been focusing on liberty. And you've heard our fights for religious freedom around the world, religious liberty around the world, including from all over the planet, including the Middle East, but all the way also to just Atlanta, Georgia, where students who just wanted to celebrate Passover with their family, Jewish students, were told, no, sorry, you got finals that week. We're not making any sort of special exceptions. But guess what? Under a week, State University. We were able to get that turned around. Even the state saying, yeah, thanks for bringing that to our attention. We're going to send an email blast to all of our students and tell them they are free to make those special accommodations with their professors. So pretty amazing work there. Again, you couldn't hear from people like Mike Pompeo, like Harry Hutchinson, like C.C. Heil. And of course, Will and I. Why not? My brother, the whole team. You couldn't do that without your support. You couldn't hear our message on YouTube, on Rumble, on Facebook. Of course, on ACLJ.org, couldn't do any of this without your financial support. So go to ACLJ.org. If you're watching right now, you can scan the QR code on the screen or just easily. I mean, it's only it's a four-letter domain, ACLJ.org. And we'll be right back with all your calls coming up. There's either going to be some changes to FISA or on April 19th, likely the House and Senate We'll just pass a full reauthorization with no changes. We talk about kind of the most high profile example of the FISA court being and FISA process being abused, obviously being the Trump campaign in 2016 when they were spying on the presidential candidate. But in 2020 alone, the court found 278,000 violations of the FISA Act and the FISA court process. That's just in 2020. When you extrapolate that out, and I know that the Wall Street Journal did some reporting that there were millions of, of improperly accessed phone records of Americans. Sure. This isn't just high profile presidential candidates. These are everyday Americans that are losing Fourth Amendment protections. What is most important is reforming the FBI and its culture so they're willing to obey existing rules. So part of the problem with respect to the FISA court is the FBI has misused FISA for its own political purposes. I hope we get some of these reforms through, and then ultimately there's a new generation of members of Congress coming through who realize, listen, we need something to protect us that law enforcement can do quickly when it comes to foreign actors. But that is not when it comes to Americans. 
and we probably need to toss this out the uh, toss this out the window. But we can't really do that. They're going to say until you've got the replacement ready to go. And so far, no replacement yet. One of the issues I see here when you break it down is that this gets to the heart of what civil rights are for Americans. And if this continues on as status quo, it's a blank check for these agencies to continue to violate that in perpetuity. Welcome back to Seculo. I told you we'd do it. We're going to do it. Some of you guys have been hold on, on hold for close to an hour, and I appreciate that. So let's kick it off right. Let's go to your calls from around the country. Ashley's calling from California. Ashley, listen to on the radio. You're on the air. Hello. Uh, great guest with Mike Pompeo, a true patriot. Um, two-part question. Do you know if any of the federal law enforcement agencies have made an official statement regarding the protesters' remarks, and would it violate their First Amendment right to at least start an investigation on them? Yeah, I don't believe there has been any statements made. We, obviously, we heard from the Biden administration because they were right. confronted with it, but I don't believe we've heard. It's just been a day. Well, and I did check because uh, I saw the call was coming in. I yeah. did check to see if there had been any uh, even a press uh, statement given by a, a spokesperson, nothing from either the Department of Justice or the FBI. However, uh, Christopher Ray will be at that appropriations hearing this afternoon. I'm curious if any members of Congress will bring it up because he's expected to say in his opening statement that there's an elevated threat to the U.S. public safety and national security while asking for more money. I have a feeling that some of the members of Congress that are on that panel may say, well, hey, uh, maybe are you talking about this? Is this an elevated threat when they're chanting death to America? So, no, but I also, it does get tricky, Ashley, when it comes to the First Amendment, um, because there is that line, and that's what Logan got in that discussion earlier with Professor Hutchison, about when does it cross the threshold of violent rhetoric, actual threat that wouldn't be pre- uh, protected under the First Amendment. So that that is a little bit trickier. That being said, know that no stone is left unturned, and our ACLJ team will look at any kind of legal action that they can take. And uh, Jordan will be back tomorrow. He was obviously traveling. We had him yesterday in Washington, D.C. He was traveling back today, so he'll be here tomorrow. I'll make sure that question gets answered from him. Maybe him and his ACLJ action team uh, can take a look at what can be done, at least from a political point of view let's go ahead continue on with these calls let's see we're going to go in order paula's watching on youtube but also has been on hold for 40 minutes so know that i appreciate it paula you're on the air hi so my mom and i in 1974 almost did not go to israel because the palestinians then had uh continually been bombing uh schools and hand grenades in uh, Israeli school children's bus, and th- it seems to me that the uh, is- Israelis have been incredibly patient ever since. When we hear people going across the the border buying a scissors and stabbing an Israeli, is yeah. this, if this isn't hate speech that deserves to be uh, taken care of by the Justice Department, why are they locking up all the uh, January sixth yeah. innocent people that just Look, went as sightseers? Paula, I-, I think that that's a valid question. You know, whether however you feel about January 6th and all of that, that could be your own decision. But I do feel like it's a valid question of why uh, your eyes don't immediately go to someone chanting death to America. And what we've seen, sad truth, is that usually when there is a big event, mass casualty event, something like that, which is horrific. And I hate that that happens in our country. It really is uh, what keeps me up at night. It's what, what the problems are you know, when you drop your kids off at school and all that. Usually what you find out is that this person who did it was somehow already on a list, was somehow already being watched, being monitored, and somehow still was able to conduct something heinous. So I would assume people who are willing to go out in public and scream death to America, maybe they should be on that list as well. Well, And as well, she referenced the intifadas when uh, concerns of traveling to Israel when there were so many terror attacks against innocent civilians Uh, by Palestinians during the uprisings of the intifadas. And what you also hear on many of these college campuses are people chanting for intifada. They're chanting for terrorist activity. Now, some of these idiot kids have no idea what they're saying. Right. And I'm willing to accept that some of them are just dumb kids who make stupid decisions and say stupid things. They don't understand what from the river to the sea means. They don't understand that. But guess what? They've had enough time now. Now you've had, let's say, at most, maybe you weren't aware of what was going on six months ago, but you've had six 
months of being educated. So you know what? No more childlike ignorance here. Uh, this is where things need to be taken care of, and we need to make sure that not only do kids know that they can't be doing this, they can't be making these kind of statements, they can't, they can be peacefully protesting. I got no problem with that. If you have a problem with the Israeli government, doesn't bother me at all. Go out there, say whatever you want. But there is probably a line, and that line is when you start calling to death to your entire nation and to another nation, peaceful countries. Yeah, I, I got a problem with that. Let's continue on. We've got a few minutes and a lot of calls. Let's go to Rick in Texas. Rick, you're on. Yes. Uh, how are you doing? Uh, Thank you for taking my call. Uh, I'm traveling, and I was listening to your, your you know, your comments on the uh, chance of death to uh, America. Yeah. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself. What if a group of people were out with signs saying death to Democrats? How how quickly do you think that would get shut down? The FBI you know? would be there immediately, and, and rightly and, so. Yeah, and and rightly should, so. Rick. They should not be chanting death to Democrats. I do think to some degree, though, maybe Democrats don't see themselves uh, as categorized as Americans in chants like that because they don't seem as outraged as they should. But that's it's very offensive. Yeah, Rick. Uh, you know, as you're traveling uh, across the country, I'm sure you're hearing that, uh, and and it's sh- sort of shocking. I think Rick was on hold long enough to go from Texas to another state. Right, so I right. appreciate that. Appreciate I always like the that. Hold. <laughs> yeah. uh, appreciate that. Continuing on, Terry in Missouri. Listen in on what or watch it on the ACLJ app. Which you know what we don't give enough love to, and it's yep. actually great. So download if you have an iOS device or even Roku a device. I believe uh, download the ACLJ app. Terry, though, you got a question or comment? Go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. I, ha- I have two uh, two part comment. Uh, the first one, death to America, doesn't surprise me. Being a, a, a veteran of Operation Iraqi Freedom, I saw that on the walls of schoolhouses in English and Arabic. Death to America, death to Israel. And the second part uh, regarding presidential immunity, if if the president is no longer immune, then what about you know, us as combat veterans, you know, because we carry yeah. carry out his orders. Terry, with, one, with weapons in here. thank you for your service. Yes, and, absolutely. And I, I can't imagine seeing that spray painted in those schools, as you said, while you were over there. But it is also a sad testament that is so freely being spoken and chanted at rallies yeah, you, here. And you expect to, honestly, Terry, Terry and I appreciate your... Uh, your service to our country, but you expect to hear that that was happening in, you know, while you're serving in, uh, in, in the war on terror, but not here on our soil. You don't hear about it as much, and that's that's the shocking part. Mark's calling from Ohio. Mark, we are running out of time, so quickly, if you give me your comment. You know, wars aren't really new in this world, and if you look back to World War II, you look at the Germans and you look at the which got split after World War II, Japanese that weren't allowed to have an army for decades after it, and if you look at the Italians, they didn't really get a lot of negative consequences, speaking as an Italian-American. And that's because they deposed Mussolini, convicted him, and strung him up. And it's really time for the Palestinians to solve their own problem because Hamas considers them fodder for Canada. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully the people of those Palestinian territories start to realize uh, who they've elected. And they did they, elect Hamas. Right, Remember that. that. Never forget that. Can we quickly get to Susan real quick? Susan, right. you got like 20 seconds. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Uh, these people who shouted death to America in Michigan, I assume, are American citizens. Uh, I hope they realize in a country such as Iran, North Korea, Cuba, if they did this, they would likely be charged and likely never heard from Absolutely, again. Absolutely, Susan. We actually heard that. People saying if, if the reverse was happening in the territories you heard, that was happening in their own, it would be the worst possible situation. Now, we don't do that here in America, but it is an aggressive time. Hey, support the work of the ACLJ. We ran out of time here for a big pitch here, so I just encourage you. Go to ACLJ.org. Make your donations today. Really appreciate it. Jordan's back tomorrow.